Jorge Gonzalez, Top Bin 90. We have the pleasure today of sitting down with Charlotte FC's head coach, Dean Smith. Dean, how are you today? Enjoying the Charlotte weather? I am, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It's a little bit different from Birmingham weather at the moment. Um, <laughs> Birmingham in England, that is. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very nice, very pleasant. You get to go in shorts all the time. So uh, yeah, enjoying it. Nice. When would you say is like the peak England good weather? What week? <laughs> what day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's only a day, I think. Uh, no, yeah, it's we have some good. It's mixed a little bit. Sometimes it'll be in June, July. You know, sometimes August, September. So you never know when it's coming in the UK. So you have to make the most of it when it does come. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to sit down with you. Kind of want to go a little bit over, you know, the past and the present here at Charlotte as well. Yep. Just your past and your present. So. I kind of wanted to start off with maybe childhood Dean, right? Um, your father, may he rest in peace, was a steward at Aston Villa for 20 plus years, right? So he kind of gave you that love for Aston Villa, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere that, you know, when they won the European Cup in 1982, you were actually able to get on the parade bus, right? That's correct. And because um, one of the players, Pat Heard, you babysat for him. Yeah. So what were those experiences like as a child? Well, it was incredible, to be honest. I mean, it was a great time to, for, for one to be an Aston Villa fan. I mean, I was born in 71. They won the League Cup in 75, won the League Cup in 77, won the League in 80-81, won the European Cup in 82, the Super Cup in 83. Yeah. So it was great years, <laughs> great years to be an Aston Villa fan. Um, you know, and as you said, my dad was a steward there. Before that, his dad was a supporter. So me and my brother naturally became Aston Villa fans, would go to all the games and, um, you know, sometimes go and work there as well just to get in. Uh, and stand on the terraces up the old end and dad would collect us after the game. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great... He, he obviously started our love of, of football. Um, and, you know, a, a friend of ours, Pat Hurd, ended up moving in across the road from us. He had two young, two young kids at the time. I think they've got three... Well, they have got three now, um, who, who, were, who were a lot older, obviously, but... My mum and dad used to babysit for them and, okay. and Pat and his wife Sue had gone, she'd gone over to the game in Rotterdam for the, the European Cup and my mum was babysitting for them and uh, yeah, so when they came back and they were celebrating through the streets they were, uh, in, the, in the city of Birmingham, um, you know, Pat saw me and grabbed me and got me on the, on the bus <laughs> with them, which was, which was unbelievable, looking down on... <laughs> 100,000 Villa fans in Birmingham City Centre as, as an 11 year old was unbelievable. That's got to be like a peak kind of childhood thing, oh, right? Mass <laughs> yeah, massive, yeah. It was brilliant and um, you know, as I say again, a great time to be an Aston Villa supporter and uh, you know, uh, you never stop loving that club um, you know, once, you've, once you fell in love with it as a kid. Love that and you were also the uh, West Midlands school chess champion, right? Yeah, along with five of us, we had a. I used to play for the school chess team, uh -huh. and uh, we got through to the uh, the West Midlands School Chess Championships and ended up winning it. And it's funny uh, when we were down in Miami for pre-season the first couple of weeks. Uh, one of the guys who won the six who was in that team, he emigrated when he was probably nineteen twenty over to the yeah, States in okay. Miami. And we met up, it's the first time I've seen him since we were 1920. Really? Uh, yeah, so it was great to catch up with him. And funny enough, I had a text off him last night and he's coming up in June, I think it is when we play, or July when we play Miami. Okay. So uh, yeah, look forward to catching up with him and his brother. Nice, any uh, chess rematches or anything like that? <laughs> no, 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 I don't <laughs> think he's been playing chess for a while, you know, so uh, yeah, I like to have a little game yeah. online now and again. And, okay, uh, how about uh, anybody at Charlotte? Does anyone here play chess? I, I think there's a few, I think Par plays, um, but okay. yeah, I've, I've not got the board and pieces out for a while, uh, yeah. especially when it's easier to play online now. Nice, awesome. So moving on a little bit, um, just your career as a center back, right? You started professionally at Wolves Hall, right? That's correct. Where um, you also got a chance to play with uh, Gary Shaw, I believe. Yeah. Right, and he was a big influence, obviously won the European Cup with Aston Villa, right? What were those early days for Dean Smith as a center back and how would you describe him now? Um, well, I, I was really fortunate that I, you know, got spotted playing and, and invited into Warsaw, ended up playing for their youth team, ended up making my debut at 17 years old. 
um, in what is now the championship. Um, and I was fortunate because I had a lot of experienced players around me at the time. You know, uh, ended up, as you said, playing with Gary Shaw. Des Bremner was another Villa player who right, won the yeah. European Cup. Um, you know, so I had Derek Stavem as a left back for a while, who played a number of games for England and, and West Bromwich Albion and Southampton. I had Tony Grealish, who played 50 games for Ireland and led Brighton out in the FA Cup final against Manchester United. So I was really fortunate that you know my upbringing came around all these players, and for some odd reason, the the manager Kenny Hibbett made me captain at 21 years old. So I was actually captaining a lot of these players as well, and it was. Uh, it was an awesome experience. I loved it. It was um, probably helped me mature a lot quicker um, than, than I would have if I'd have just been left on my own. To be Why fair. do you think he made you captain at such a young age? I actually asked him a few years later uh -huh. when I became a manager, and he said uh, we had a meeting. I must have been about nineteen, twenty, and we had a meeting about bonuses and something. And he was saying, you know, we can't have we can't, as a club we can't afford to play the, pay these bonuses. He said, so we need to change the bonus system. And I spoke up and said, well, what if nobody signs it? And he, he, he said he thought that was a bit brave of a 19-year-old, 20-year-old lad to be <laughs> saying. And uh, he thought, you know, he's got a little bit. He's, uh, he doesn't mind, you know, voicing his opinion. So, you know, I think he's got leadership qualities. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, I mean, they turned out to be true, right? Yeah. It's a managerial yeah, career. Yeah, <laughs> he certainly did. I mean, I ended up captaining every club that I played for. Uh, which I'm quite proud of and uh, obviously I always believe that people see the leadership qualities in you before you do yourself mm, and even good, know yeah. um, you know and I can honestly say that myself where you know I made Jack Grealish captain at Aston Villa and he was like 23 I believe yeah like and I and I could see that he's somebody who people would follow but he's that humble he would help them he would help create other leaders as well he's he wouldn't be one who's just wanting followers. He wants to create other people. Mm. And, you know, a great sign of that is one of the more experienced players who was the captain um, got injured um, and he was missing for the playoff final. And Jack was the captain. He made sure that he came and lifted the trophy with them. And I thought awesome. it was a really nice touch. That's awesome. Um, moving on a little bit too, T, just your starting as a managerial career was also at Walsall, right? Like you were a caretaker, right? The yeah. team was kind of in a relegation zone. You kind of saved them, right? You spent some years there. 2015, um, you made it to the cup final, right? That was their first um, time at Wembley, right? Yeah. So talk to us about that experience. Yeah, I'd, I'd done some coaching before. So when I finished playing, one of my best friends in football, Martin Ling, was manager, head coach at Leighton Orient. Yep. And he invited me to become assistant there. So I've done four and a half years with Martin there. Very successful time with Leighton Orient. We got them promoted from League Two to League One and stayed in that league. Um, and then I ended up going back to Warsaw as head of academy. Um, a friend of mine was the head coach, Chris Hutchins. Right. And unfortunately, Chris lost his job. Um, you know, the results weren't good. As you say, they were in the bottom. The bottom of the league um, and the the chairman and owner who i knew really well as well you know didn't really want to get rid of chris because he he got on really well with him and knew what he was but i think it had become a real tough time you know the fans were against him at that time so the owner asked me if i'd take over um and i said only if chris is happy with that and i know chris is leaving but you know chris was a good friend of mine i just didn't, didn't want to walk in his right. shoes um, and that was a relationship I had with him and the, and the owner at the time. And, you know, I went in there and uh, Chris was happy for me to go and do it. And I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I never felt we were doomed right from the start, although we were seven points and, you know, from safety and some big games to play. Um, but I also knew I had to change the mindset of the players as well. And, you know, being an assistant manager at Orient had helped me deal with that in working with players and getting to know them. And, we added two or three players and managed to stay up the final game of the season. Southampton away. Southampton got promoted um, to the championship and we stayed up in, in League One. And it was a good a, day for both of you. Huh? It was a great day for both. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it was a start of yeah. my managerial career because if we had got relegated, you know, I think then, you know, uh, Walsall would have gone different. Yeah. I think Walsall would have gone and got another manager. I was only caretaker to the end of that season. I'd have gone back to being head of youth, you know. Um, 
so it, it's amazing them sliding door moments. Yeah, right. And I think the the fans affectionately called you the Ginger Mourinho, right? <laughs> they they did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was my nickname. We played we played Chelsea yeah. at home in the cup as well. Uh, JT was playing in that game. I always remind him, and we, we actually played really well in the game as okay. well. So, yeah, I do. You know, we we changed the the culture there at Warsaw and the identity, and we had a really successful five years, as you say, that day at Wembley, the first day. You know, uh, the gates or the attendances that we would get at Warsaw would be, you know, five six thousand fans, and we took twenty two thousand to Wembley against That's Bristol awesome. City. You know, I had played in front of 70,000 and yeah. it, it was brilliant. So we didn't play well on the day, unfortunately, Bristol City, you know, and I, it's funny and my relationship with the owner again was really good on this because I remember being so disappointed after and I went up to, to see him afterwards uh, after the game and he went, Dean, listen, we've come to Wembley, we've got beat, we're all disappointed about it. He said, but their budget is 10 times ours. Mm. He said, so sometimes you have to look at it for right. how it is, um, which was a nice touch. He didn't have to say that, you know, uh, but it was, it was a great touch and just, you know, uh, helps me cement my relationship with him as well. Nice. Is that important for you? Like those relationships, like you talk about that, like, you know, because there's the coach, there's the person, right? But how do you mix both of them to have a good relationship? Well, I think you have to get to know people. I, you know, there's there's managing up, um, you know, managing people who you're working underneath, or just, you know, in the in the chart of of management. Right. You know, we have an owner, we have uh, executives in in higher positions, and your job is you've got to work with them right. for the best of the, the best we can for the the football club that you're working for. So, them relationship support you know are important. I always say that. You know, yeah, you don't always have to agree. You, you can debate, um, but do it cordially, you know, uh, do it respectfully. I think that's really important. But it's likewise, you know, with me talking to players, you know, we all want to get the best out of each other for the club. Mm. Uh, if the players, if I work with the players, I'm respectful to them and they can see that, then I've got more chance of improving them and helping them and then wanting to do better for the club. And right. if that happens, I think all the club comes together and he's, is as one yeah. um, and I, I just see that that could be a football club that could be in an office it could be a business anywhere I yeah. just think that unity the, yeah unity is massive um, I, and I, I stress you know you've got to be aligned you've got to be together but you don't always have to agree and I think that's important as mm. well awesome awesome take me to when you were 2018 and you become the Aston Villa manager I mean that's you're pretty much touching heaven at that point your uh, club that you've always followed that you love like what was that like when you when Dean Smith becomes Aston Villa coach well yeah, I'd, I'd been I'd been approached um, by Aston Villa that they'd be interested in talking to me I was really enjoying you know being the manager or the head coach at, at Brentford at that time right really good club good people to work for I learned a hell of a lot from them you know, and I think I certainly helped them as well. You know, um, I sat on uh, on panels and, you know, brought in Thomas Frank as an assistant of mine, good friend of mine. I'm so proud and pleased to see what he's doing at Brentford. Um, but, you know, Villa came calling and, you know, I it turned my head, of course it did. Um, you know, it's my club, it always has been, always will be. Um, you know, and it was a real tough, de but, but it was still a real tough decision because I had to take the emotions out of, mm. you know, deciding yeah. whether I took the job. I knew it would change lives, not just mine, but my family's yeah. because we, we live in Birmingham. Um, you know, and you develop heartstrings with people right where you're at. Yeah, and it's you like do. And, but Birmingham being a football city as well, you know, 75% uh, of the city are Aston Villa fans and right. love you but 25% of the Birmingham City fans and don't like you. So, you know, I knew it would change. And if we weren't successful, my daughter was at, at school. So, ah, okay. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. so she's going to get, you know, a little bit. All my family of Villa fans, they go to work. They're going to get yeah. sticks. So it almost extended a little bit. And I knew it would change a, a it's lot. It's very interesting perspective. Like, I guess yeah. we don't think about kind of some of these things that like, because in other countries, the U.S. is slightly different, but they live, breathe football. Yeah. 
totally. You know, you go to you go to work on a Monday, yeah. and it's the talk <laughs> of the town. So you know, I knew that it was going to affect a lot of people. And I had mm. to be right that the project that Aston Villa was, were, were offering me was going to be a good one as well. Yeah. And if it wasn't, then I, I honestly wouldn't go, even though it, it would have tugged at my mm. heartstrings because I, I loved Brentford, my time at Brentford and the the club. Um, but you know, meeting the uh, the CEO and the sporting director at the time, and, and then the owner, I knew it was the right decision to make. Mm. I mean, from fifteenth place. So that 2-1 win against Derby County that got you promoted to the Premier League. Talk to me about that day, those emotions. Yeah, I mean, Aston Villa's an old club. 1874, um, it was founded. And that season, we had a run of 10 wins on the spin. Mm -hmm. And it broke a record it that had been going for 100 years. So to be a record holder of the club that I loved for winning games was incredible. But you couldn't rest because you knew there was bigger things at the end. Right. So, you know, the day, the day at Wembley was incredible. I, um, if, there's a, if there's a chance to get promoted, uh, either going straight up or going up through the playoffs, I'd go up through the playoffs every time. Really? You're doing a Wembley Stadium in front of half of your fans, 40, 42,000 fans, and it was, it, it was brilliant. And, I had no doubts we would win. I d we didn't play as well as we could have done on the day. It was a pretty even game, but yeah. you know um, we scored the two goals. And you know, but before the game, I was confident. Yeah. You know, we'd beat them three 0 at their place. We'd beat them four 0 at home. Right. Uh, in the season, and I just felt we had better players. You know, we had Tammy Abraham, Jack Grealish, John McGinn. Um, just really, really, really good people and good players. And uh, I just thought we would have too much for them. I love that. You know, it's very interesting that you say that you would, you would rather go up that way, but yeah, uh, like just yeah. the experience, right? Yeah, I mean, doing it in front of all the fans, you know, you, we, we could have played Bolton the last away game in a season and you got three or yeah. 4,000 Villa fans and you get promoted there yeah. and it's brilliant, but to do it, you know, at Wembley and, yeah. and the fact that Villa had lost at Wembley the season before against Fulham in the yeah. playoffs, you know, it was, it was special. And you could see the joy. I mean, even driving from our hotel to Wembley, which was only a mile, you know, the Villa fans were there were every. There was claret and blue everywhere, and everybody was singing and clapping. And Did you get I, a call from Prince Williams after? I know he's a big Villa fan. Yeah, no, but I uh, I met him later on in the season. Uh -huh. um, I met him a few times since. Got him to come into the dressing room before okay. the cup final against Man City. Um, he came into uh, open. We had the new performance centre and he came and opened that and got to spend some time with him and invited him back and he came to the training centre awesome. again and yeah and uh, sent me an unbelievable letter when I left Villa. Um, really? Yeah, just thanking me for everything I'd done and telling me to be proud of my time there. And That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, really touch. good. Really good. Person. There was one day, Dean, that I really, really didn't like you. And that was the day that Liverpool played Aston Villa. <laughs> <laughs> I have to bring it up. As a Liverpool fan, that 7-2, you know, they've come off of just winning the Prem after 30 years. Yeah. You know, I think we were still undefeated to that point. And then it was just an onslaught. Like, from the mistake from, I think, I can't remember who our Adrian. Goal yep. That he gave a ball to Joe Gomez and I think Ollie Watkins, Ollie Watkins. recovered it. I he, think Jack recovered it and squared it for... Uh, that Ollie. might have been what it was. Yeah. But three goals from uh, Ollie Watkins, two goals from Jack Grealish. I think McGinn scored as well. Ross, Ma Ross Barkley. Ross Barkley. Some of these shots were going off the defenders and going I into know. the goal. I think there was three deflections <laughs> in the game. Yeah. There was. Um, but it was incredible. And uh, we'd, we'd stayed up the... I always, I always said the hardest time for any team is once you get promoted into the Premier League, you stay mm. there that first right. year. And we only stayed up on the last game of the season uh, by getting a point at West Ham. But once you've done that, you can actually then, you know, go and build and be stronger. You uh -huh. can be stronger than the three who are coming up next. Right, right. You know, and you could overtake a few teams who, you know, uh, probably haven't got the power that Aston Villa would have at that time. And we went and signed five players at the end of that season. Ollie Watkins being one. Um, we signed uh, Emmy Martinez, who yeah. became a World Cup winner with Argentina. We signed Leon Bailey. Um, we signed uh, Matt Cash and we signed Ross Barkley on, on a year's loan. Yeah, from Chelsea. Yep. And them five players 
made us a much stronger team. We won the first game against Sheffield United 1-0. I think you guys were still undefeated to that point when you played Liverpool, Yeah, so, right? so what happened, we didn't play the first game of the season. I think because Manchester United and Manchester City had finished the season so late being in European finals. Right, right, right. So the first, we the first weekend of the season, we actually played a friendly against Man United at Villa Park. And we actually beat them 1-0, Ollie Watkins scored. And then the first game we played Sheffield United, beat 1-0. Then we went to Fulham away, beat them 3-0. And then it was Liverpool and we beat them 7-2. Oh, yeah. And then next game we played Leicester, beat them 1-0. So we'd won our first four games of the season. We, we, were, we were flying. And by Christmas, I think we were still third or fourth in the league. And then we, had, uh, we played Man United away and... Uh, I think we'd have finished probably top eight that season, mm. but we got we got COVID in the camp. I don't know if right, you remember right. Liverpool. Well, you will remember yeah. Liverpool ended up playing our youth team in the FA Cup. That's right, yeah. Because we'd been hit by COVID in the dressing room, and it laid us low a little bit. To be fair, so uh, I think that change of momentum probably cost us a top eight finish that season. Interesting, awesome. Yeah, I just I had to bring that up. You know, <laughs> as a Liverpool fan. Um, Jurgen Klopp after the game, he, yeah. just, he looked at me, he shook my hand, he went, wow. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, that, uh, I remember briefly seeing a video of him saying something to you before the game started. And I want to say you kind of laughed, but then at the end, what did he say? Just wow. He, he, he just literally went, wow. And I can honestly say, I was still nervous at 5 2. <laughs> Liverpool, <laughs> really? were, well, Liverpool were that good. That's true, yeah. yeah. Liverpool <laughs> were that good. At, at that period in time, it was like, yeah. whoa. They were tough to play against. I mean, the previous season, we'd gone 1-0 up at Villa Park and they scored Robertson header in the 89th minute and then he, uh, Mane scored the winner from a corner, I think, yeah. in the 92nd minute. You know, we're 1-0 up <laughs> with two minutes to go. So I was always nervous, but we scored the sixth. And in all honesty, that game probably could have been about 11-4. Yeah. It was crazy. Ollie Watkins hit the bar, he put one wide and... Trezeguet had missed a couple as well. And, you know. It's one of those games as a like a neutral you enjoy because yeah. there's so many goals. But as a as a fan of Liverpool, I'm like, man, this is really going to ruin my weekend. <laughs> I remember it. I'm sure Man United played Tottenham the same day, and Tottenham had won six two yeah, or something against United. Yeah. And everybody was talking about that. And then yeah, our game was late. It was like, wow, there's a better one. <laughs> yeah. Nice, awesome. Let's move on to your time here at Charlotte now, right? Talk to me about. I want to know, like, you're obviously coming from Leicester where relegation battle, right? Like, I think you mentioned it in a press conference where first game's Man City away, right? And you're trying to keep a team up, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that pressure, that intensity that you spent at Leicester coming to MLS to a brand new team, what are maybe, like, the differences that you're seeing from that? Because it's, it's just a different vibe, a different pressure, a different... Um, no, I don't think there is. I mean, people talk that there's obviously no promotion and relegation in the MLS, yeah. but I've always said it's the pressure that you put on yourself anyway. I mean, I knew going into Leicester it was going to be tough, um, but it was a seven-week, eight-game job, you yeah. know, and I looked at the squad. I thought if we could get them ticking, then we, we would have a chance. I felt that we needed 11 points to stay up. Um, it was, in fact, what we needed. We just fell a little bit short. Um, but going in there, I, th I think they'd got three points from the last 27 yeah. or something like that. So you knew it was a team that was struggling. Um, there was players that were training with the, uh, the under-21s that I needed to get into the first team and give them a lift for whatever reason. You know, that what was happening. Um, you know, we... We actually gave it a go. I actually thought the lads came to the party a little bit. You know, we went th we went three 0 down at half time against Man City. And yeah. You're thinking, dear me, but we got back into it three one. Hit the post, could have made it three two with James Madison. The next game was big at home against Wolves, and uh, we beat Wolves and got that belief back. Um, but then we played two rivals who were, probably should have won either both Leeds and and uh, Everton at home, James Madison missed a penalty at 2-1 up, yeah. right on the stroke of half-time. But it wasn't to be in the end and, you know, uh, I enjoyed my time at Leicester, it was very short. Um, I thought we did as well as we could, considering what had happened before us. And, um, you know, we only missed out by the skin of our teeth, but I just felt that when this Charlotte job, when I got approached for it, that. I was ready for a change to, mm. to go and challenge myself in a different league, in a different culture. 
you know, I'd had my dream job at, at Aston Villa, right. at, at, you know, in the Premier League and got them to the Premier League in, in England. And, you know, I thought for me, when my next step was to go abroad somewhere and, and, and go and manage. You know, I had a lot of offers from championship clubs, which I just didn't feel, you know, was right. And uh, this for me certainly whetted my appetite and, you know, got the juices flowing, so to speak, a little bit. And, uh, you know, it hasn't disappointed so far. I'm really enjoying it. I love, I love to hear that. Um, that kind of leads to my next question. One of the things that the front office mentioned, you know, was, you know, one of the reasons for the coaching change was that they felt like this squad had more to give than what it had given last season, right? From when you came in, what was the vibe, the, the culture, the morale that you felt in that locker room to what Dean has added now in the last four months that you've been here? Well, the thing that I always say is that I can't judge a culture or the behaviours that went on before me because I wasn't here. Right. You know, I always believe that, you know, for instance, you, you come into, you, you could probably tell me more than me because you come in here for press conferences and you know, you're, so you'll be feeling and hearing and seeing the culture right. more so than me. Um, all I can do is come in here, be myself, but have certain values and bring certain values uh, and behaviors because I think behaviors are what set cultures. Mm. You know, how you behave every day, right. you know, uh, how you treat people every day. I think they're the main things that set cultures. So I know right from wrong. Um, I know how I want to be treated. I always said when I become a head coach or a manager, I want to be a head coach or manager I would have, would have wanted to be managed by. So, you know, the players, I've got to earn their respect and they've got to earn mine. And it's a two-way street, but also the same with the front office. And, you know, the, it's always a two-way street. And you only do that by being respectful to each other. I, I don't like walking down a corridor and not greeting somebody when you walk mm. past them. Uh, for me, that's just how I was brought up. And they're the sort of things I think help. Um, you know, I always feel one of, one of the human needs is to feel valued. Yep. And I don't think enough people value people. Um, you know, and I've spoken about, there's a, there's a lad in there who cleans every night and some people, people don't know who've done it, but they just accept every morning they walk in, their bins are empty, their floors are clean, yeah. everything's tidied up. Somebody has to do that. And that can be difficult, right? When you're a professional a soccer player or a coach, you know, you can Google this person or oh, they got followers, right? So yeah. that can get to your head very quickly. Very quickly. And, and that's why I always say it's important to stay grounded. Remember who, where you came from. Yeah. Remember who you are. Remember who your parents brought you up to be. Right. And they're the big things for me that, you know, probably stand out and why I remain so ground, grounded and, and want to. And I want to be consistent in my beha behaviours. I want us to be consistent as a, as a team that's challenging at the top, you know, of the, of the MLS. I love that. I mean, would you say, I read somewhere that you changed the Brentford analytical room to the learning zone, right? You did that here as well, the auditorium to the learning zone. Mm. What are some of those key principles that you want the players going into these learning zones to kind of develop and mesh? So the game of football is their game. It's not mine. It's not my coaches. They're the ones who have to go out and make decisions. So when we go into the learning zone, you know, we're reviewing games or we, we're reflecting on games or, or we're previewing a game over the next opponents. So I want the players to be learning in there. Yeah. I want them to be talking and seeing and, you know, uh, debating, you know, because I'm not always right. You know, uh, what I've got is a lot of experience that can help, but sometimes they might see something on the ball that I haven't seen. Yeah. You know, and so they're not wrong by telling me, oh, well, I saw that. Not a problem. Brilliant. Because they're the ones who have to make the decisions. What we do is try and paint pictures for them of what might happen. Okay. You know, and give them patterns that can help us, but I would never restrict a player and, and say, listen, you've only got that ball, that ball, that ball, because they might see so, much, so many different things. I love that, I love that. And I think from just like you said, like I've been here since the beginning pretty much of seeing this team grow. And I see when players talk about you or talk about this season, like they feel more comfortable. There's like, a, there's like an aura and I feel like you've kind of helped do that, right? By letting them express themselves and 
being able in those learning zones to, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Yeah, I mean, and, and the easiest thing for me straight away was to put a structure to make us hard to beat. Yeah. So a structure without the ball. I think that's always the easiest thing to start with once you, you put them building blocks in. Um, you know, we, there'll be certain principles within that system as well that I ask for. Um, you know, I watch a lot of the games and a lot of the teams in this league and they, they want to play inside you. So we pack the inside and make them go outside us. It's simple. Yeah. It, it's not difficult. And once you explain that to a player, they go, yeah, I, I get that. And then, you know, when they're on the outside, then they're going to be throwing balls into your box. So this is where we expect the balls to be thrown. This is where we expect you to be clear of the ball and how to defend. Awesome. Um, moving on a little bit on just MLS in general. I know one of the things that you mentioned after the Vancouver away game, right? Like that was the first game where when you uh, grow up coaching in England, you see the traveling fans. You go to Vancouver, there might be five fans right in yeah. that right so what other differences have you noticed about mls and english football i think that's one of been one of the biggest differences um I, i'm still trying to get my head around the you know a game 7 30 but we kick off at 7 38 <laughs> <laughs> you know if a game time is three o'clock or 7 30 in the uk you kick off at 7 30 so uh you know, um, I like, it's like the way MLS time. <laughs> yeah, there's the the starting time, and then there's MLS time. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and and I suppose they're the biggest difference is, um, uh -huh. you know, uh, the game. No, the, the game. I'm expecting to see differences as the the weather gets hotter. Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that's going to slow the game down a little bit as well. Um, you know, and you're going to have to start being a lot more creative with your with your your changes yeah. as well. So I'm looking forward to, to that and experiencing that for the first time. But, uh, you know, I, I'm enjoying it. I, as I say, that first the start of that first game against New York blew, my, blew me away. You know, the flyover and then the last lamp yeah. from and the crowd and, you know, and, you know, we want more. We want more of it. I want I want us to be after to be able to open that top top ball yeah. every game i would love to do that you know to to be that successful there everybody wants to keep coming to yeah. to watch uh, charlotte fc i think you you're having the right approach and we're we see that from a fan base like like charlotte has grown from a soccer city that people you always felt like there was something here but now with the charlotte fc team people know that this is a soccer city, which is amazing. And I think it's the Carolinas team as yeah. well. You know, it's, it's not just North Carolina, it's South Carolina as well. It's, it's the Carolinas team. And, you know, if we can be successful and, and show how well this franchise is doing, then hopefully we can open that top bowl all the time. Nice. Um, I had the opportunity recently to interview Carol Swiderski, mm -hmm. who is still a Charlotte FC player technically yes. at Verona. I asked them kind of straight up, hey, if the opportunity comes for you to stay at Charlotte, would you take that? And he kind of left the door open for that, right? So I'm kind of asking you that same question. Is Carol's future done at Charlotte? Could something happen? You know, in football, you never know. But from your perspective, I mean, we see a bottom now with the 11. Yeah, I, I say in football, you never know. I don't know. Thankfully, you know, I don't have to deal with contracts and players and stuff now. So, you know, Carol going, um, you know, I was, I was obviously spoken about, about it, um, you know, and I was OK with it when, when it happened because I knew that Carol wanted to go back to Europe as well. So I was quite comfortable with it happening. Um, but I don't know what's in the contract, whether he's allowed to come back or not. So, but never say never. Okay, awesome. And a few more and then we're finished. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, no worries. One of our subscribers, Michael, wants to know if you'd ever like to coach your son. You know, I know you mentioned <laughs> before that, you know, you kind of uh, critique his game, but would you like to coach him one day in some capacity? Yeah, I'd like to, obviously, um, you know, but I've always said to him, you've got to be good enough to, to get into one of my teams. <laughs> um, I love that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he knows... He's actually playing well this season, so you know it's uh, it's, it's good to watch him at the moment. It's been it's nice to be over here, being close to him and, right. and watching. And I've I've been to quite a few live games already, um, and he's having a good season so far. So uh, I'm quite happy with how he's doing. I love that. And then my final question is: When Dean Smith leaves in Charlotte, we have here in 2042, so you have a long time. <laughs> <laughs> what does he want to be remembered for in the Queen City? 
I, I want to be remembered for you know, people coming and smiling at, at games and, and seeing us being consistent and successful. Um, you know, pushing boundaries, you know, uh, with players and how they think and how they improve. Um, you know, developing players, but also developing a culture that, you know, uh, puts Charlotte FC firmly on the MLS map. Awesome. Dean, thank you so much for your time. We really no appreciate problem. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.